There, there we go. There we go. Oh, look, you got a good background and everything. Everybody's coming in. Uh, it's, a, it's a booth that's all of three feet long, wide. So it's pretty narrow, but it's quiet. Okie dokie. Hey, guys, welcome back. We are back with Dr. Mitchell Elyar. We always are excited to have um, his generosity and his knowledge. If we haven't met him, Jeremy or Cunningham, special education boss, training everyone that sits at the 504 IEP table to navigate and negotiate successful student outcomes. Dr. Yell is an author, a hearing officer, a presenter, a training. Um, he does all things amazing, was a special education teacher for countless years. So um, we want to get right into our topic. Welcome, Dr. Yell. Um, Thank you. So I, I'm, I'm guesstimating that this topic that we have tonight is probably one of the most things that you see before yourself when you're looking at cases, and that is least restrictive environment and placement. Would that be accurate? Yeah, it's probably not as much as FAPE, as Free yes. Appropriate Public Education, but it's it's right up there. Yeah, and so, um, so kind of tell us what would be the difference between, um, although either of these could be a component of that, kind of tell us what the difference is between FAPE and kind of what we're gonna talk about tonight. Okay, well, you know, FAPE, really has to do with the the educational services the child gets. So do they confer a free appropriate public education, which the Supreme Court has said basically is uh, an education that enables a child to make pro reasonably calculated to enable a child to make progress. On the other hand, LRE is a uh, it's a clear um, I mean, yeah, you have to do it. You have to place a child in the least restrictive environment, which essentially means that they have a opportunity to interact with non their non-disabled peers. Right. So um, I find that it is the most, other than did you get a copy of your procedural safeguards, Mr. or Mrs. Smith? I find we just, we we talk a lot. I talk a lot in the present levels. I think those are paramount. Um, appropriate, um, ambitiously appropriate goals, right? Needed accommodations. And then LRE, he's going to be in life skills. And so um, I don't think that was the intention of it. I think I use, you know, the statement from Andrew F for every component of the IEP. And I find in my experience and, and our partners that LRE is, in my opinion, rarely calculated, much less reasonably calculated. I believe that often schools find based on a disability that that goes into this slot. So, um, and you and I have talked before, I, I, you know, 10 years ago, I couldn't get a child in general ed. Couldn't get a child included for a million dollars. And now the big push is, and I see it in waves, I'm sure you do too. Everybody's going to general ed and you can like it or lump it and we do not have resource. So as a relate, can you define LRE as a foundational principle? And then can you talk about a continuum of services? Because I don't find schools talking about a continuum of services. Yeah, well, so there's really uh, a couple of things that that you have that we have to uh, be aware of. One is um, that that is clearly a mandate of the idea that Youngsters with disabilities, actually there's two parts to the mandate, to the LRE mandate. The first part is uh, whenever possible to the maximum extent appropriate, children with disabilities should be educated with children who do not have disabilities. Uh, the idea that uh, if they're in the normal uh, ebb and flow of schools with uh, non-disabled children, they learn that way and other uh, children will learn from them too. Um, but th then the second part says that if the school has made good faith efforts, essentially, to supply supplementary aids and services to keep the child in a least restrictive setting, um, if that doesn't work, they can move them to a more restrictive setting. But that requires that they do make good faith efforts to try and educate a child in the LRE. Right. And can you talk well, about it? You were saying too, and excuse me, but you were talking about the continuum, and all public schools have to have a continuum where they start out kind of a general classroom with resource room, with supplementary aids and services. That is not more restrictive than a general ed classroom if you're 
providing resources like supplementary aids and services, but then you do get more restrictive where you have like self-contained settings and, and special schools. And the idea is all public schools have to have those available. They don't necessarily have to have them on, on their campus, but say if they, they may have, and a lot of schools will do this, they'll have contracts with other districts for right. the more restrictive settings. Right. And so um, I just opened like 52 questions in my brain. So um, when I visit with amazing school-based members, they believe that resource is self-contained and they say they don't have the data to support resource. Or I think probably our 800 uh, um, enrollees for this webinar have been told or heard. Um, literally, we don't. we got rid of it. Our state got rid of it. Our district got rid of it. Um, so kind of speak to that and what would be the response back to a campus if it was a parent by themselves? Well, of course, that, that's a problem. They, th that is not a more restrictive setting. A resource room is considered by the U.S. Department of Education to be a, a supplementary aid and resource that is is you use to essentially keep the child in the general ed setting. So the notion that it's a more restrictive or self-contained is just plain wrong. And, and schools cannot get rid of um, the continuum just because they feel like it. You know, I mean, that's there for a reason. And the resource room is part of that least restrictive environment in the general ed classroom. Right. So I was in an IEP meeting this last year, and um, this young lady really struggles to read. And she's going into sixth grade. And the principal said, we want her to stay in general ed reading so she can have rich conversations with her peers. So um, having a rich conversation with a sixth grader is not gonna make you a better reader. Mm -hmm. So what would you say to that? No, so let me get this right. They wanted to move a, a child to a self-contained setting? So I wanted her to go to resource. Ah, I see. She's, she's been given lots of education. She's been in school for sixth grade for six years, right? She's a fifth grader and she really struggles to read. She has great short-term memory deficits. And, you know, I would just be devastated if she wasn't with her friends. But yeah. being with your friends is not how we decide on, on LRE or placement, correct? And that is absolutely right, Karen. Um, in fact, probably the most important decision in it, LRE has not been heard by the Supreme Court yet. Um, but it's been heard by many circuits and probably the most, I would say the, the most adopted one is out of Texas, the Daniel R. R. V. Uh, decision. Yes. And that has said, like almost all of them said, really that what is appropriate for the child is the first consideration. Then once you decide where you can, what's appropriate, then you determine where can you place the child. And that's when the LRE comes in. But it's secondary, in the words of the Daniel R. decision, it's secondary to what's appropriate for a child. Right. One of the um, other things that we're hearing, and um, not only that we got rid of it, I hear that on the front end. Um, well, Karen, um, I had a, a young man who's in junior high. The junior high, I think, had 1,700 children in it. And I said, he finished sixth grade doing terrible in math. So I want him in math resource next year for seventh grade. And the assistant director or somebody said, well, he will be the only child in junior high in resource math. So you know what I said, something clever. So I said, well, fantastic. He's going to get really targeted intervention. I doubt that every child at the junior high is either in life skills or general ed. I doubt that's true, but either way. And then yeah. what happens is then they start putting other kids in there. So who's really on the hook for that? Because unfortunately, we love teachers and paraprofessionals. They're the ones, for lack of a better word, that are shoved out and have to say it. But we really know it's an administrative decision. It's a hiring decision. So how would you respond to that? Well, of course, there are so many factors that must not. I mean, the law is real clear. Uh, OSEP. Uh, the U.S. Department of Education is being real clear. There are certain considerations you cannot make um, in the LRE. And one of them is making LRE first and then saying, well, let's figure out what's appropriate for a child. Uh, 
So you have to kind of put the what before the where, so right. to speak. Another thing you can't do is predetermine placement. And it kind of sounds like you're describing predetermination of the child's placement. That cannot be done. It, you know, I mean, can be done. It's illegal as heck to do it. One of the other things that we hear a lot, and I, I get a lot, um, it's almost like people are penalized for putting their child in ECSC, Early Childhood Special Education. So we have a kiddo who's in there from three, four, and five. They're greatly impacted by their disabilities. They may be low verbal or nonverbal. And then we're at the annual IEP meeting because we're going to start kindergarten in this fall. They've got to go to self-contained. They've got to go to life skills. And for me, I'm like, you you didn't even have an unsuccessful LRE. You didn't even have it. You haven't even given him a chance to fail in general ed. Yeah. Right? So what would what would your response well, be? That? That's kind of an interesting thing. You know, schools... And this is right from the Daniel, our, our decision out of Texas is the schools do have to make good faith efforts in order to to educate the child in the LRE. Now, that doesn't mean you have to go so far as to putting the child there and watching them fail. Um, that's a decision the team makes. Right. You know, after you determine what's appropriate, you say, well, where can we de where can we um, educate the child that is that in which we can meet the that appropriate education. So I would say too bad they didn't, instead of say least restrict environment, they didn't say least restrictive appropriate environment because the two go together. Yeah, and I always it, like to say the most supported setting. I think least restrictive seems, I think it, it I, I understand the intent. I think it confuses yeah. people. We hear stuff like <laughs> right. we're, we're bound by LRE. I want to say, I don't even think you know what it means, but um, as it relates to a continuum of services, um, you and I both know that schools have limitations, right? They're not psychiatric units. They're not um, hospital bays. So let's talk about when um, a child is unsuccessful at a campus and what does that look like when we're asking for out of district placement? Because schools do have limits. They cannot serve every single child with every combination of disabilities. Yeah, that's true. Um... I find that differs so much. Um, you know, larger districts are a little more willing to do that out of placement. Uh, smaller districts tend to be not so crazy about it. Um, you know, it's not going to be that large a population of students, but some students are going to need that. And that's why we have a continuum. And that's why the law says all schools you know, regardless of their size, have to have a continuum. And that's where you're, I think you're very right too, uh, Karen, is the term least restrictive is so confusing to many because they think, oh, that means the mainstream. Well, no, it doesn't. It means the educational setting where you can deliver an appropriate education. I mean, it could be that, um, that a hospital setting would be the least restrictive in setting because that would be the appropriate and most supportive, as you said. Right. And some kids are, you know, some students that I've served are literally in a self-contained or homebound setting from three to 18 or 22, because that is what's appropriate for them based on the acuity of their disability. Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk about, um, um, do you know the phrase shoehorning? Yeah. Can you talk about that yeah. phrase? It's it's a a phrase that uh, has been used by attorneys to uh, to really talk about when schools play make placement decisions first and then decide what's appropriate because what they do is they have the, the placement in mind and they shoehorn the child into that setting to make it appropriate. Well, that doesn't make it appropriate, and so that's a a very bad practice shoehorning. That means essentially. Again, what before where? You determine what does the child need and then what's the least restrict environment in which you can provide those services for a child. Right. Um, when we talk about placement, um, you know, the schedule of services and you know where he's going to be placed, if there's a program, can you talk about our, and this is LRE too, I, you know, I always say it's not a one and done. He, I, have, I have a child right now who's in life skills, but he is in... Um, um, advanced orchestra. 
he's this great cellist, but he can't read. So yeah. um, I always say we do it by content area. We don't just say the and you know these kids or these disabilities. Talk about that a little bit. Oh yeah, that that's a very good point. Um, uh, in fact, uh, I mean George Sugai, and when he used to talk a uh, talk, he would often talk about we can't view kids as just having disabilities or being right. behavioral, having behavior problems, because every child is different. They have areas in which they may have be very disabled, like reading, and they may have other areas in which they're gifted, like cello. Yeah. In that case, you have to meet the child where they are, really, and um, provide an appropriate program for the disability or the reading problem, whereas also, you provide appropriate program would be a, a orchestra class, for example. So, yeah, it does not just one size fits all. Right. Even for talk, child. Right. Can you talk about um, we get these phone calls. My clients get a phone call and I, I, I want to believe it's with a good intention. Hey, Mr. Yell, little heads up. We just want to let you know that Johnny is going to be going to the ACIP program. He's going to be going to the autism. I just wanted to let you know that so you have a heads up before the meeting. Talk to me about the legalness of that. Okay, that would be predetermination. Because if you're saying, no, the child is going to go to the ACIP program or whatever, you're predetermining their placement. That's illegal. You can't do that. So what you'd have in instead what you'd have to do is talk have an IEP meeting talk about the child's needs and then talk about once you've determined what the needs are then you can talk about the placement but it would not be legal i mean it's not appropriate to do it in that manner you're doing it in backwards you know you're not meeting the child's unique needs you're saying oh well they they will will meet their needs in in this program, well, you might not, right? So when um when we come to the table as a, a collaborative committee of all five stakeholders, um should the LEA be saying we when we get there we we recommend that he's in the ASIP program and then talk about other options and those pros and cons? What about that conversation makes it appropriate versus this is what you get and you can either sign an agreement or sign a disagreement? Well, the first thing the LA, LEA should be doing is not discussing any placement issues until the the uh, the program is determined. And then you can talk about placement issues. And you might bring that up, but there has to be other options, too. And that's part of the discussion. Um, it, it's mistaken. It, 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 if you read the idea real closely, it's really not even doesn't have to be the IEP team. The way idea is written, it's it, they talk about the placement team. Well, in most cases, that's going to be the IEP team because that meets the requirements of the law's placement team. So, right. but the IEP team has to do the IEP first. Right. So good. So good. So um, I know that when you see a case and it's been an LRE case um, that you believe that the parent met their burden. Can you kind of talk about some of those elements? I know people ask me, what is predetermination? And I say, you know, we come in on no and we leave on no. It doesn't matter what I offer, what you offer, what Alicia offers, all this other information. Nope, nope, nope. And so I think sometimes um, school-based members feel like that we invited the parents and we let them say what they want to say, and that's meaningful participation. Can you, can you talk about when you get a case or you're reviewing or cases you've seen where the parent did prevail under an LRE or placement issue? Well, it, it often is. Uh, one of the most frequent reasons that I think parents do prevail is they've they've shown that one of three things probably that they the school has predetermined placement. They've decided what the placement is going to be beforehand, or maybe they've shoehorned. Maybe they've taken, uh, taken and done the placement first, and then do it back. Then do the the IEP. So it's backwards. And the other major mistake is making it out of, well, this child has this disability. We educate all children here uh, who have autism in this program, or children with emotional 
disturbances go to this program. We can't make decisions based on anything but a child's individual needs. And one of the worst things is administrative convenience. Oh, administrative convenience, AC. Yeah. Yes. All right. Well, I, I know that we've got a bunch of questions. And so Alicia, I'm going to let you do what you do wonderfully and um, read us the questions from our attendees. Perfect. First one is, what are the differences between a resource room and a self-concluded class? Okay. Well, that's, that's a very good question. Um, a resource room generally is defined as one, two hours of specialized help and the child is the majority spending the majority of the time 80 90% of the time in the general education classroom in fact some states actually have a division where they say you know two four, up to 4 hours is resource room 5 hours or more that's self contained some don't but essentially self contained is when the child spends the majority of their day with peers with disabilities. So the resource room is not considered to be more restrictive on, in the continuum of placements. It's con That's considered to be a supplementary aid and service to keep the child in a general education setting or, or if you want, uh, well, the least restrictive setting. And do you have, uh, sorry, Alicia, do you have a case that speaks to that? Because obviously we go straight into 300.115, which talks about supplementary aids, resource, but the way you speak about it is so much user, it's, it's user friendly. So how would I say that's not more restrictive? Uh, a, a resource room? Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think of, of cases that have really uh, looked at, at at that issue. And it's it tends to be more at the the U.S. Department of Education, especially the Office of Special Ed Program in their policy uh, documents and policy positions have said basically that is that that's the dis dividing distinction between a less and a more that is self-contained is more restrictive um, and that's, that a, a resource room is just part of the general classroom. And if you look at the idea, you will not see in the continuum of placements, the resource room. Okay. And for all intents and purposes, it's it's general ed. Unless, again, it's if say probably more than half the school day yeah. is that's a self-contained classroom. Got it. Hey, Alicia. Hey, I don't know that this one is a question so much as a comment, but I'm gonna read it. I have seen worse. A school only has certain resources for a few grades, and then the child has to move schools every few years. This is difficult for the students to change schools every few years and also tears families apart as typically developing siblings stay in the first school and the parents have to deal with more than one school when they are already stressed. I guess, what are your thoughts and opinions? Well, that's, an, that's, a, that's a tough question. Um, one of the reasons it's a tough question, if courts have pretty much said uh, that neighborhood school is a preference, but it's not an absolute right, that if a child can be cannot receive an education in the neighborhood school, but there is a nearby school that does offer that, that would be permissible. Thank you. My district got rid of resource classrooms and now expect EC teachers to squeeze in resource time for students who need it. They end up doing this inefficiently because while they are doing this, they also have eight other students for which they're providing special ed services for. Essentially, the data is then presented and recommended life skills. Is this an appropriate way to offer resource time? Oh, yeah, I, I would believe so, yeah. And I think the real answer there is to are, are the teachers really monitoring the student's progress? Um, I would say if you're have in a situation like that where the teachers are not really able to teach because of the, the, the way it's been structured, uh, that will show up in progress monitoring. And we have to do, the bottom line is, you do like the Supreme Court said, you write an IEP that's reasonably calculated to enable a child to make progress. And if they're not making progress, the clear implication is you have to do something. 
And if that something is the the program where the child is not being educated, is not he is not he or she is not getting enough of what he needs, is you have to make a change. Thank you. School lunch and recess time are being considered as part of my child's mainstream minutes. Is this correct? Um there's really nothing that says it's not correct. Uh, and I've seen uh, hearings in which they've they've held well PE and and recess. And that is has been often considered. Yeah, it's part of the general education setting. Now, you could make the point, I think, that it's 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 not really the least restrict environment if they're just, say, coming in for lunch. It's just a to kind of a token. Let's put them in, but that would—that's a more difficult question because again, so many of these things depend on individual issues. What's happening with the individual child? Okay, my son is in a self-contained class, which is working well for him. But my concern is is that he is with kids of different grade levels. Is this an appropriate placement? Well, the bottom line is if he is doing, if his progress is good, if he's making progress, I would say that's probably fine. Um, I mean, you could not say, well, you couldn't say file a complaint saying my child's doing well, but he's with other kids of different ages. So it's really all about is the child receiving a free appropriate public education. And that's that's why I said earlier and the Daniel decision pointed this out that appropriate education is really the primary mandate of idea. LRE is very important, but it's secondary. Um, you have to determine what's appropriate for a child. Then you determine where can we fit this appropriate education in a least lesser restrictive environment. Dr. Yell, I just have to jump in and I, in 28 years, I think I've always, I always think I've heard everything in a meeting and we logged on to a meeting the last week of school and literally the general ed teacher was, wait for it, the librarian. And I said, and he said, she said, I know him. I said, well, library is not a state standard. Do you teach curriculum in library? She said, no. I said, so next time let's have a general ed teacher for the student. Okay. I've never, I got, you could have knocked me over. I was like, and the nicest lady, she's a librarian. We don't teach anything in library, but it was just, they were just going to slide that in. Yeah. Oh, that's a um, little iffy there. Yeah. I mean, the, the entire reason that uh, I remember when I started teaching, the law just said you needed a teacher. Didn't say a special ed teacher. Didn't say a general ed teacher. Uh, and the reason really the general ed teacher was is they represent the general curriculum. Yeah. And if you have someone that doesn't represent it, well, they're not really fulfilling the role. Yeah. It was very nice, though. Yeah. <laughs> when in a self-contained room, as determined to be the best environment for the child, is there any reason that the child's access to PE, art, and music should be removed completely because they're in a self-contained classroom? No, not really. Okay. So I, I'm so the child is in a self-contained setting and <clears throat> because of that <clears throat> they're taking away the these other subjects or that's what the it sounds like is that they're saying, well, he's in self-contained, so he can't go to art, PE, music. No, that has nothing to do with it. The the idea is self-contained setting, you know, is obvious is supposed to be where he's he or she is receiving the an appropriate education but why you would remove certain aspects of the child's education doesn't really make any sense when i was a self-contained teacher we had it either two ways they could go with their general education peers or my whole class would just be a part of one grade levels rotation all yeah. of them had to go all of them had to be able to go well, yeah. that's not individualized. Right. Okay. Unfortunately, recently, they were with a parent whose child recently graduated from the 18 to 22 program, which she was forced into because they claimed not to have resource. And they did predetermine and not 
show her to be in her LRE. She graduated with a certificate of completion. What can be done now, if anything? She graduated June of this year. Well, so she didn't really graduate with a legitimate diploma. So according to the idea, uh, she would be able to receive uh, education till in most states the day she turns 22. Okay. The only reason you exit is if you're, I mean, if you exit for graduation is it has to be a legitimate graduation. You have to really graduate. You can't just walk across the stage and say, oh, they've graduated. Because then uh, literally the idea still would cover them. So okay. I would think that would be something, for example, would be a, a complaint issue. Perfect. Um, Six-year-old child in regular preschool without an IEP with a medical diagnosis of autism, they repeated pre-K. The school district is saying you can't compare a preschool environment to an elementary environment and is pushing for a more restrictive placement in a categorical classroom without even experiencing the gen ed in public school. What are your thoughts? Well, in terms of actually experiencing, um, I, again, I go back to the Daniel decision. You, they have to provide supplementary aids and services in an attempt to, uh, to maintain a child in that setting. Now, that doesn't mean you have to keep, I mean, you don't have to keep the child there until they fail. And I've heard that too. Well, they didn't fail yet, so we're still keeping them there. But it, it's, up to, it's up to the school, to the IEP team, to the placement team, to be using these different procedures, these different supplementary aids and services in an attempt to receive a FAPE in the LRE. Does the parent have a meaningful stake on the placement team? Yes. Uh, the placement team, I mean, if you look at the idea, the way it describes this team is it's it's the parent, it's the LEA representative, and the appropriate members of the IEP team. Well, that's why, you know, it's fine to have the IEP team do it because you have your LEA, you have your you have your parent, and then you have the members who have to be chosen anyway. So, I mean, they would be chosen. So it's usually the IEP team, but it's always the parent and always the LEA. Okay. What types of specific resources would you look at to help prove that your school has predetermined placement for a special needs child and have subsequently broken the law? Well, in terms of cases that I've seen and done, on predetermination, you really just have to have some kind of uh, proof that that the 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 essentially the the school district decided, or the LEA decided, or the teachers decided without the parents. And Karen was saying earlier, it's kind of here you go, sign it, and uh, be on your merry way. This is what we're going to do. That's predetermination. Um, one of the ways I've seen it. Uh, I've seen attorneys uh, prove predetermination is through using emails and texts where school districts, individuals have decided, well, we're going to do this, and but we want to present it to the parents. Of course, we'll present that to the parent. That's not the way you do it. You have It has to be a discussion with the parent. They have to be meaningfully involved. I just want to add on to what he just said. We had... Um... I'm a big fan of open records and we pulled open records for a family that I represented in a due process hearing. Uh, the email went out to everybody, ex including the parent that you're being invited to a D and Q IEP meeting, which I always say like my natural hair color, a D and Q meeting doesn't exist. We don't have any kind of meeting till we get there. Right. So talk about predetermination. <laughs> He's D and Q'd, but we're going to invite you April 7th. So what, what would be the, if that's how it worked, we could just send emails to parents to go, it doesn't qualify. Yeah. Um, and, and that was problematic. We've also found in open records, not that I'm going to rabbit trail y'all, literally where the principal said, listen, you know, Mitch, when we get in there, you say this and I'm going to say that. that mm -hmm. That's problematic. Yeah. And, and I think too, 
Um, one of the problems, and we've talked about this before, is so often administrators just don't understand what the responsibilities are under the law. And, you know, teachers hear the administrators saying things that are not correct, and they're worried about countering their, 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 the LEA representative. Exactly. Okay. I have students on my caseload that due to their specific learning disabilities cannot access the general education curriculum to make progress on the standards without me reading to them. I go around and around with those above me. They say I cannot read the text to them. So the student is sick, sitting in a second grade general education classroom expected to read while not knowing the ABC sounds. How is this fair and appropriate as well as giving them access to meet the standards? Our state allows the ELA read entire in third grade. Meanwhile, they're suffering from environmental traumas, feeling defeated for not knowing how to read. Well, I think that's that's a, a fairly typical problem is I think especially administrators think we have to teach the standards. No, uh, sometimes you have to teach access to the standards. So if they can't, if they can't read, why would you expect them to read on a, on a fifth grade level? You know, that you have to, you have to teach them how to read before they can even access those standards. So that I think stems from kind of an inappropriate understanding of, yeah, we do the standards, but it doesn't mean we're sta standards bound. It means a lot of our kids have to access the standards and they need skills to get there. Perfect. If you wanted to give a parent a heads up about a potential placement, so they aren't blindsided, would it be appropriate to tell them what all different placements are on the table? Well, I mean, it, it probably uh, would not be the best idea, but I mean, if there are a number of different options and they're saying, well, we're going to just, we're going to determine what's appropriate for the child, then we're going to look at these options. And that would be fine. Can you explain how important educating a child in their home school is to LRE? Well, that's a good question. Um, they're all good questions. That's that that's kind of gets back to that neighborhood school. One of the, if you read the idea or you read the regulations, uh, you will see that neighborhood school is preferred. But courts have pretty much you routinely said that although there are definite preference, they're not an absolute right. And so that if it's if the child needs. A, a different setting other than a neighborhood school to receive an appropriate education. That would be up to the IEP team, including the parents to discuss. Okay. Can you trial a student in another setting? Yeah, you could absolutely do that. Um, you probably would need to, you should write the IEP in such a way that uh, we're going to try a, a certain placement for 30 days or we're going to try this. So you could do that, but I would write the write it in the IEP or an amendment to the IEP. Okay. Will the school pay for private placement until the child graduates? Well, that if if they're if they have not a, provided an appropriate education for the child or say the school has determined that a private placement was necessary, they have to pay for that. In the recent Andrew case, um, he wound up graduating and the school paid for him to go all the way through school. But uh, I would say if, they, if they're making the placement, they clearly have to pay. If, if the placement comes about because of say, mediation or something and they agree to it resolution such they still have to pay all right i think this one is a good last question for dr yell before he goes and catches a plane can you clarify the following must a child be actually physically placed in each setting along the continuum or is LRE based on the student's need according to robust robust assessment finding i often hear you have to start in gen ed and move the student to a more restrictive placement following a period of time. And this sounds like a wait and fill. No, you really don't. It's it's up to the team. If if the team decides, say, we've done the or we've 
the supplementary aids and services that are not satisfactory and they're not allowing to receive a child to receive an appropriate education, then it would then it would be fine to move them. Um, you don't have to wait for a child to fail, which I've heard and Karen's probably heard too. And that's one of the big problems I think we see with schools that are really, really go all in on MTSS systems is kids get stuck in the systems and they'll, they'll uh, the educator, the LEA will say, well, you know, they have to be in tier two for six weeks. No, they don't. They, they have to, you know, you can certainly have them in different tiers, but if they need it, um, they need it. And that, that would be discussed. So uh, a parent could bring that up. A teacher could bring that up, that we don't think this is an appropriate setting for the child. Uh, let's discuss a different setting. Good questions, Alicia. Yeah. So um, I am going to hang on for a little bit and answer some questions because my plane has landed. But thank you, Dr. Gell. We know we're going to give you a little break for July. and We'll see you kind of when the school year uh, starts again. Thank you so much for your generosity. You are so popular. We had 800 people register for this webinar and more. So they appreciate your time and your wisdom. And we will see you at our next training. Thank you okay. so much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Okay, now I just need easy questions. There's only 81 of them. Oh, 82. oh. 84. Okay. All right. If a district does inclusion, but doesn't train teachers on the appropriate way to do so and provide appropriate support, could this impact the student's LRE? My district says they do inclusion, but teachers aren't trained and the sped and gen ed teachers don't work together for these students. So most students get moved to self-contained. Yeah, I mean, if we haven't trained any educator to implement their job with fidelity, whether it's general ed, athletics, um, how whatever kind of employee you are at the district, we didn't provide them proper training. Of course, that's going to impact the children. All right. What is the best practice to do for new students enrolling from out of district who have that LRE code of IE 16 or above? For example, a foster child was in a private residential, no fault to their own, just where foster agency provided educational services and found a placement in a different district. And when enrolling into that district, they put them in a public separate school, aka the district's behavior school, just to get them enrolled for comparable services, even if there's no history with behaviors. Ugh. Yeah, I, you know, unfortunately, it's, you know, I wish we had a hundred settings in special education. We don't. Um, when a child moves into a district, uh, we should follow the same protocol as if they would consider them a transfer student, whether it's district to district or moving from Pennsylvania to Montana. Um, it's a transfer, right? And so we should match in as much as possible the services they came from, use those 30 school days to look and see if we need to do more testing. And then we have a permanent IEP meeting to determine um, what we're going to agree upon for the next 36 instructional week. Perfect. What about when a school says that the program offered is what the SPED department in the system uses? Is that predetermined? Well, that will... We'll, Yes. Yeah. So that none of that language is inside of IDEA. Certainly none of that language sits inside of state statutes. When you hear something so preposterous, um, I would ask for a copy of that language to be provided to you by close of business and a prior written notice. A lot of times school districts have practices. Practices aren't laws. They're not documented. Um, policies are documented. Regulations are documented. Laws and statutes are documented. And also, you can always reach out to your state's uh, uh, SEA, the State Education Agency, it'll usually be your Department of Education. They will be able, when you call compliance, they will be able to pull up the school board regulations for Calcutta Parish. They can pull them up and send them to you. So even if for some reason somebody forgets to send them to you, your state has all of the school district, the school board's regulations that may not sit inside of the state regulations. Perfect. Can you explain what it means to be in life skills? Yeah, so life skills is an alternative academic product. Um, and so it is for students that are greatly impacted by their disability um, and they are going to need functional academics, um, whether it's hygiene, reading, math, writing, 
um, life skills uh, to be successful and um, the state standard when even modified greatly is over their ability to comprehend and apply that. You mentioned administrative convenience, probably Dr. Yell. But so what good, about, wasn't it? Yeah. But what about lack of funding, specifically at charter schools where hiring qualified staff and people for services is extremely difficult since the pay skills are lower? It's not about lack of funding. It's about where we put our money, right? So all of us have a budget in our life every month. If somebody came in and audited us and said, you need to eat out a little less, you need to go to the movies a little less, you need to go to the water park a little less, we could reallocate our monthly funds. When you pull school district funding, and you can pull it, you can ask for the budget for any federally funded school in America, a college, a charter school, a public school, you will be stunned to find out over two thirds of their budget goes to people that don't work with children. And so we can reallocate those funds. If it was a priority for us, we would reallocate the funds. I don't see schools that have a shortage of principals. I don't see a school that have shortages of um, honors teachers. I don't see schools that have a shortage of coaches. And all of those things are important, um, but I, I, I believe that most schools are what I would call top heavy in the administrative um, funding and hiring. Okay, I'm in California. My son's district is trying to tell us that they have no options for my son other than a non-public school for the emotionally disturbed. I've been pushing for an SDC class on a public school campus. Any recommendations? So is there an SDC class? Um, so those aren't at every campuses. It's a great product when schools have those. We have great specificity in these self-contained units, whether they're adaptive behavior, um, autism units, um, SCC, but they're not a requirement at every campus. Um, you are required at elementary, junior high, high school, and post-secondary uh, and, and secondary schools to have um, general ed resource and alternative curriculum. When you get into specialization as it relates to acuity and behavior, that's going to be a little bit different. And so um, if they don't have it, they don't have it. So they have to provide that, they are allowed to provide that at a, at a, at a placement. What rights are there if part of the team does not agree with placement, however, the student is not emotionally or mentally able to do in the classroom or even in a self-inclined classroom due to the safety concerns? So, I mean, again, we talked about this earlier, schools have limitations. They're not, they're not, you know, the military, they're not hospital bays, they're public schools, right? And um, teachers are amazing and do an amazing job. Sometimes a child has such high emotional, behavioral, psychiatric needs that public school is not appropriate. And so then we have to look at out of district placement at the expense of the district. A student who is deaf only getting an interpreter two hours a week, yes, a week. Since no progress is being made, the new IEP will not include an interpreter at all in the classroom. How is this LRE? Oh my gosh, I'm, I'm just trying to find my nice words. What? If you need an interpreter, you need an interpreter. Of all the things that you could have for part of the day, that wouldn't be one of them. So I would reach out to, um, you should have a state school for the deaf in your state, I would reach out for support for them because they support your educational system. I would reach out to compliance at the state level, but that's completely 1 billion percent unacceptable. If the school requires the parent to sign consent for services prior to the development of the IEP, is that allowed? No, we, we don't sign anything until we've developed. You can't sign for something you haven't helped create. So it's going to be a no for me. The only thing that you sign ahead of time for is you're providing them consent to do testing after you've been informed. What is the best practice to disagree with an LRE placement when done incorrectly? So best practice. You know, I, I think it's important that we, which is one of the things that we train on vehemently is people get so attached to the school. I graduated school 40 years ago and I can remember my teachers, my teacher's names, my 
the students that I was in school with, when I was in the band, I was in track, I was in golf. It's such an important focal part of life. Um, if if you were getting your car worked on and somebody came and said something you disagreed with, you wouldn't go, okay. Disagreeing is part of the human experience. So you want to use words that I don't feel comfortable with making that decision. You want to use words that are tied back to Andrew F. March 22nd, 2017. And, and that simply says that the LEA, after reasonably calculating the IEP, must create one that will enable the student to make progress with um, appropriately in light of their circumstances. And that applies to all pieces of the discussion of the IEP. I would say, I don't believe that we've reasonably calculated this and you're denying my child a free appropriate public education. You are denying my child a free appropriate public education. You have to put that and that your child is being harmed when you disagree. Those are legal standards. So as a child that is classified as preschool disabled, what are their options for special education services? Do they need to have a special education teacher written into their IEP? So if you are going to school uh, from three to five, it's because you have a special education um, eligibility. So those services are gonna be based upon that eligibility, the characteristics of that eligibility concurrently with your medical diagnosis and your present levels. So um, usually in those settings, it's pretty standard what we're working on. We're working on um, you know, communication, cognition, behavior, language to get them ready so they can be successful in kindergarten. So I keep hearing it is LRE by putting a high school kid into a regular ed, even though that causes frustration as they now have a tech with them. And so everyone knows they need help and that is hard for a kid and they end up having anxiety and we see more behaviors. However, the school just keeps saying it is better than pulling them for the resource room by sending them into the regular ed with tech support. Yeah, I mean, I think we go back to the, you know, we go back to what Dr. Yell said. It's so important that we, when we write IEP goals that they're based upon identified deficits in the present levels, we write a goal based upon what the baseline is, rate of progress and expectation. If he's not meeting that rate of progress and expectation is lined out in the IEP goals, then that's where we pivot. But we don't just put kids in general ed because we want that. We do it because that's where they're the most successful. And, and sometimes they are and sometimes they aren't. When they aren't, we have to change the delivery of special education. In a high school, the order of general education to special education self-contained. Does the teacher in the college prep class or in-class support does a special education teacher need to make the modifications according to the IEP? That was so the special education teacher supports the general ed teacher if it's a general ed class. Um, but yes, they would work with that general ed teacher to um, understand what the content is, and then they would modify the expectation for the learner. Are schools required to have a resource room? Uh, if the humans and if there's humans in the school, I've I've never seen a school that didn't have a student somewhere that needed a resource. Um, but it's tragic how we are dying on this rock, literally telling um, educators, paraprofessionals, evaluators, we got rid of. And uh, Alicia knows our team members know. We've heard people say the state they got rid of it. So no state, no district, no campus can reduce the benefit of IDEA. And since IDEA didn't take out 300.115, we won't be taking it out either. What do you do if the school has predetermined placement without the team having the decision at all? How can you navigate not seeking alternative placement, finding a better options? What are the right words and long to you or probably language to use? Yeah, so I, I appreciate that you've offered us this one option. I'm greatly concerned that we haven't uh, talked about a continuum of services. Um, I don't think the district's ready to do that today. So let's look at reconvening. And when we come back, we can propose the continuum of services to the parent. I believe they can make an informed decision. And, and I would reach out to the district level at that point 
um, often the district level would not agree with um, what's being shoehorned or sort of pressured or pushed for the parent. Can kids in an SDC setting be pulled out of general ed classes in junior high? It just depends. I mean, there are kiddos in those settings that can be successful in science, but they're not successful in language arts. It, it depends on every single child. Every child is very different. But we certainly shouldn't do them like you were talking about by a group. Either the group can go or none of us can go. Right. So if we have a kindergarten student who is possibly needing a different placement, do they have to go through resource first? They don't have to go through resource first. Um, what I do know is that if you don't try in a setting, you're right. He wasn't successful there. And there's nothing sadder for myself or one of our partners is when we get a, a client who, have a, who has a child that was wrongly placed in a self-contained setting for years and years and years. And then we're not even able to professionally advocate for them to have general ed provision of ed education because they've missed years of instruction. So then it wouldn't be in, in appropriate. So we do it by content area and we do it by, you know, a robust present levels. What do we fully know about this child and what do we believe that he can do with proper support? We decided at an IEP meeting that an appropriate setting is an inclusion type setting. Should the specific setting be listed on the IEP? If the parent agrees, is the school responsible for ensuring that the student is placed in that type of setting? I was told by the district that they cannot guarantee a specific classroom. My child has an IEP due to speech, but is also receiving OT and PT. Yeah, so if we agreed that, you know, Levi is going to go to inclusion math, then I can't say, I just want Mr. Jones. I can't stand Ms. Garcia, right? And special education students are placed in the master schedule before general ed students. So I certainly couldn't say, I like Alicia as a better teacher. I don't like Donovan, um, but it has to be that content area and that special ed support. So if we said for seventh grade, he's going to have math with inclusion for 30 minutes out of the 55 minute block, then that has to occur. The parent doesn't get any say on who is delivering that. How do you determine if the school has done all it can for the child in the general education classroom? That is tough. You would have to know what is all you can do, right? I, I think that, you know, one of the saddest things that I hear and Alicia hears is that's what we do here. Um, and all of us know that are adults that we used to do stuff that, thank goodness, I used to do stuff in my 30s I don't do anymore. I used to, just as an advocate that I don't do in my 40s anymore, that I don't do in 50s, right? Because I learned a better way. So. I think the greatest tragedy is our lack of support for educators, our lack of support for special educators, our lack of support for building a multidisciplinary team at the school. So we have PT and OT and speech and general ed and paras and special ed teachers. And some of them have never even sat in the same room together to talk about Billy until their annual IEP. So I, I think that we've, we've unequipped the people on the front lines that are delivering education to the students and then it affects everybody. Can they offer no placement for him other than a non-public option? No, well, I mean, they have to, um, you know, if you got to a non-public day school, it would be because there is a chain of events, a chain of, um, I don't wanna say attempts, right? Um, I don't find that, oh, you're, you're three, you're going to a non-public day school. That would be such a rare um, situation. When I have kids, and I probably have three a year, probably, I think I have three kiddos right now that are out of district placement day schools, um, they just were not successful in public education. And I have a pattern of that. Um, and depending when I became involved, uh, you know, we did what we could to make him successful or her successful during the school day. Um, but it shouldn't just be, oh, I show up, you have a five-year-old, he has to go to a non-public day school. That would be um, an egregious situation. I feel like we've answered 37 questions and we're still at 86. Yes, we're going to answer five more questions. And since you're the good counter, I'm going to let you count. All right. Give me one second. Yeah.
All right. I'm a high school resource teacher. This is an elective class and 275 hours of service minutes weekly. That's a lot. That's a lot. That it. it was just a comment, but I just seen 275 hours and I was like, that's a lot. Yeah. Okay. Our school's allowed to have self-contained settings away from all typical developing peers, i.e. all ninth graders, but those in self-container on a ninth grade campus, those in, oh, wait. Those that are in self-container on the ninth grade campus, those that are not, are in a ninth to twelfth grade class. And that's that's still legal as long as they're providing that content in those settings. You could provide, you could be on a ninth grade campus and be providing self-contained instruction for ninth to twelfth graders. Is it correct if the school says they have to choose between a 504 or accommodations that he can't have both? 504 is a combination. So um, it's not true that you have to choose between a 504 and IEP or accommodations. We are charged with, we have an obligation, an obligation, duty, and responsibility. I call it an odor, an obligation, duty, and responsibility to educate the student with the support appropriate based upon their identified disability. If a child has been in a sub-separate room and was put in general ed for inclusion, but is in the wrong grade, supposed to be in fourth grade, but he was put in third grade, is that a violation of faith? Um, I mean, that's a violation of what grade he's in, right? So you are on the paperwork, it says what grade he's in. So I've had parents have kids that are fifth graders that said, oh, he'll be successful with second graders. But that's, that's against the state standards. It doesn't work like that. If we did that, we would have you know, 16 year olds in first grade. It doesn't work like that. So you have a grade, which is on your paperwork. And then that paperwork, we implement fourth grade, self-contained resource, general ed for that student. So, so no, we don't have him in a grade that he's not in. Okay, this one made me laugh. If a student is placed in ISS and attends class via Zoom, is this still counted as a change of placement? Did you ISS him in his living room? I don't even know how that's a thing. Well, if he's via Zoom, do you make him come to school for in-school suspension? I don't even know how that works. And how could you get suspended if you're a Zoom student? That is, that's a whole ball of spaghetti I would like to unpack for you. This anonymous attendee said they sent you an email and they would like you to look at it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, yeah, not right now, just like in general. Let me just stop what I'm doing. <laughs> but it's an anonymous. It is your name anonymous. <laughs> I thought that was cute. I sent her an email. Can you ask her to look at it? <laughs> yes, yes. Because, yeah. Okay. Can you speak on the importance of a prior written notice as it relates to LRE? So not only can I speak upon it, you guys are all, because you watch this webinar, you, you can um, join the Academy for two weeks for free. And we're finishing up a series next week. So Tuesday, July 2nd we'll finish up a series related services under IDEA. And the next series we're gonna start July 9th is a proper, pristine, purposeful, um, compliant prior written notice, which must meet all seven requirements under federal law. So you definitely wanna be in that training. All right, this is a banger to end it up. You ready? Okay. Can you describe the difference between academic and educational. Yeah, we, we should never say academic. So the law says that we're looking for an educational need and it's access to the, ed, you know, the general education curriculum. We never say the academic curriculum. So everything that happens to a child um, when they're in school, there could be an, ac an educational need that's not in the normed and average range. So that could be language, uh, communication, emotional, social, academics, functional, um, related services, braille, orientation and mobility, music therapy, um, feeding, walking, um, different types of literacy. So any of those are an educational need so that we can make a student post-secondary ready, which the federal threshold is the same for all children, disabled or not, gainful employment, independent living, and further education. So thank you guys for coming. Um, we're going to capture the left, I don't want to say leftover questions. I'm sorry, we don't have time for any more, but we certainly want to get to them. Um, any directions you want to give us, Alicia, before we roll out? We also want to share with you, would like you to all join us at Special Education Academy YouTube. 
We're doing a lot more content there. We hope every single platform that you hear about us stays, but sometimes the platforms unplug their platform for the day or somebody votes to get rid of them. So we'll always be on YouTube, Special Education Academy. So go there and follow us for more content and more videos. Yes, and this whole webinar will be posted on that YouTube. So for on everybody who are asking if they're going to be able to view it again, just go on over to the YouTube. Forever, forever. Thanks, you guys, for participating. We'll get you the schedule out for the new webinar. It's going to start in August. Remember, we get it right for the child. We get it right for everybody. Thanks, you guys, for being here, and we'll see you in the next video.